Good morning, church. Here we are again. 2020 is an interesting year, and I appreciate you guys being flexible and rolling with the punches. I've been telling the kids, and I've been saying at work for months now. Adaptability is the word of the year. And so we are doing that, trying to keep you safe, trying to keep our neighbors safe, trying to do the loving thing, which is what we think that God would want to do. And we will continue to lean into hope. We'll continue to lean into love and um, continue to trust that God is bigger than anything this year can throw at us. We're in the middle of a series on wisdom right now. Wisdom is what we need for times like these. Wisdom is more than what we put in our head, but it is the experience and the skill necessary to use what we have in our heads in ways that lead towards peace and flourishing and things like that. And so in this information age where everything seems to be falling apart at present, we don't need necessarily more knowledge, although some of us do. We need more wisdom. And so we have been using the Psalms as a guide to wisdom. And this week we come to Psalm 3. And let's begin with just a reading from Psalm 3. If you will, hear the word of God. Psalm 3 says, and this is a psalm of David, Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are standing against me. So many are talking about me. Even God won't help him. But you, Lord, are my shield. You are my glory. You are the one who restores me. I cry out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep and wake up because the Lord helps me. I won't be afraid of thousands of people surrounding me on all sides. Stand up, Lord. Save me, my God. In fact, hit all of my enemies on the jaw. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Rescue comes from the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. And so I spent some time this week with this psalm, and it occurs to me that we have the opposite challenge in Psalm 3 than we had in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 presented us with uh, what for many in the modern age is a conflicting image of God. We have uh, in recent years emphasized, I think rightly so, that God looks like Jesus. And Psalm 2 portrays a God and frankly a Jesus that comes to shatter the nations with an iron rod to bring his fierce wrath down upon them. And so last week we asked, what are we supposed to do with a psalm that portrays God in a way that is so different from how we have come to see Jesus. And we wrestled with that tension last week, and I invited you to live inside of that tension. And living inside of that tension is where we might come to more nuanced visions of God, where we might find wisdom as we engage with that. And now, here in Psalm 3, we have the opposite problem. We are those who follow Jesus, those who ought to be at least versed in the ways that Jesus has taught us to live. And among those, the injunctions, the commands to go an extra mile, to give your um, undergarment as well as your cloak when it is asked, to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies. And now here we find David in Psalm 3 asking God to shatter the teeth of the wicked. And so it creates this tension from the other end. Not only is the Psalms going to challenge how we see God, but the Psalms are also going to challenge how we see ourselves. And so what are we supposed to do with something like Psalm 3? Because the truth of the matter is, if you keep reading through the Psalms, if you just take one a day and spend time reflecting on it, you're going to find this sort of impulse more often than not, where Either they're calling or declaring God's wrath, or they are calling God to come down and smite their enemies. And we're going to look at some more of those because the Psalms nuance them in a variety of ways. But how do we read this in light of the fact that we have been called to love our enemies, to not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good, as Paul would say in Romans chapter 12? What, what are we supposed to do with this tension? And so, uh, this morning from a social distance, me way over here, you guys way over there, a few thoughts on uh, reading Psalm 3. 
The first thought is similar to what we talked about last week, but we probably need to repeat it again and again and again, is it's very important to read the Psalms as they are written and very important to let the Psalms work as they want to work. And what I mean by that is in our tradition, in the churches of Christ, we have, uh, like many con congregations, many tribes and corners of Christianity, this tendency to distill everything down into a particular way of looking at things, into a particular way of putting stuff inside of our head. And so we are sometimes privy or s susceptible to the temptation of being a hammer that makes everything look like a nail. And you just can't do that with the Bible. So for instance, the Psalms <clears throat> are not a place to go necessarily for uh, commands or examples or necessary inference. It's not as easy to say as, see, here is David praying, for instance, that God shatter the teeth of his enemies, and that settles that. We have a, an example of that. It must be approved, and so God shatter the teeth of our enemies. Um, the whole situation is rather more complex than that. As a matter of fact, the Psalms as poetry and as wisdom are not places to go for um, rules as such in the first place. That's not how poetry works. Poetry is not the sort of place where you go and you say point one, point two, point three, so on and so forth. It is not clear cut and dry. It's not there to delineate or to lay out rules. Poetry exists rather to be experienced. And it's in experiencing the situation and the circumstance and the language and the feeling and the plight of the poetry that poetry teaches us things. And it doesn't necessarily, at the end of the day, teach us those rules, but it teaches us to see the world in a different way, to consider nuances and angles that perhaps we hadn't considered before, to work those into our thinking, to let those challenge and create tensions in the way we look at things. And so we want to ask a different set of questions, not necessarily how can I apply this psalm? What rule comes from the psalm? What command or example or necessary inference is to be found in the psalm? But rather, where is the author coming from? What circumstances did they face and how can we put ourselves in their shoes and live inside of that and try to understand where they come from and how they wrestle with God and how they wrestle with their circumstances? How can we empathize with them? How can we change the way we see the world through their situation? And so, just like we talked about last week, social position becomes important. Most of us are reading Psalm 3 from someone on top of the pile, someone on top of the pile. But even David is the king, and this may have been even well before David was king, or maybe later in his reign when, according to the header in Psalm 3, later in his reign when his reign was in jeopardy because of the turmoil surrounding his children, it changes the way we read things. At best, David was the king over a small nation in the scheme of things that was surrounded constantly by larger powers who would make uh, plays for his kingdom. And so David, in any circumstance, doesn't read from the top of the pile as a superpower, but he is writing this from somewhere further down the list with those over him more powerful, creating trouble for him. And so we want to make sure that we're reading the Psalms from the position that they come from. We want to make sure that we're not being anachronistic in our reading, which is, is just the word they taught us in school for reading it out of time and out of place. You remember sometimes movies have what they call anachronisms, that's where some actor, usually some double or some stunt person, usually not a main character, the focus of the thing, they, they get something wrong in the shot and it's something that just doesn't fit in in that time and place. And so um, it is the person on some Viking show that I've watched recently who is rowing a boat on this Viking ship back in medieval times and he's wearing a watch, a digital watch, and he forgot to take it off. It just doesn't fit. He's coming from a different time and a different place. We want to make sure that we don't read the Psalms like that. We want to recognize that when we put ourselves in David's circumstance, in David's position, in what David was facing, it's going to change the way 
we understand it if we just read it from our circumstance. And we want to, while we are reading it from David's position, we want to stop and we want to take time to let it uh, work on us. To just let it stew for a while, to let it percolate, to let it do its work in our mind. And so often in our Bible readings, what we want to do is we want to get through, say, the Bible in a year. And so you read a certain number of verses every day and, and we get through those and we kind of get in this accomplishment mindset, this meritocracy mindset. Look at what I've done. And, and so I've read my verses for the day. Now it's time to go on and do something else. We're so busy. And so we read our scripture, we shut our Bible and we go on about it. But the Psalms really invite us to slow down. The Psalms really invite us to lean into the circumstances and the situations that we are reading from as David goes through this experience in his life. And it asks us to, to be empathetic. How would you respond if you were in the situation that David was in? How would you respond if you were in a situation where your enemies surround you and your enemies taunt you and your enemies belittle you and your enemies say, oh, God won't even help you? What would you do in that situation? What would you feel? And really, when we stop and think about it, maybe one of the takeaways from Psalm 3 is that while we don't have, and we, we should be careful to see enemies around every corner, well, we don't have enemies like David had enemies. We do have circumstances. We do have situations. We do have things that come up in our lives that place us in this position. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in the Psalms this year as I read through them is that um, 2020 provides ample opportunity for praying these sorts of prayers. What if the enemies that surround us are, are, are not people? but circumstances that are far bigger than us. What if these circumstances, whether it be a, a pandemic or whether it be injustice or whether it be economic ruin or, or whether it be some health crisis that is more personal in nature, maybe it's the, the loss of a job or a layoff. What if these forces that are bigger than us are the ones who are pushing us into a position of despair and hopelessness who are by virtue of their very hugeness of the, the inability of us to see around them. They're the ones who are whispering in our ears, even God won't help you. Uh, this is what um, I think Jesus refers to in the Lord's Prayer, the one we pray every Sunday, the one that if you join us for morning prayer, we pray every morning, the one that we're going to pray here in a few minutes. I think this is what Jesus refers to when, when he says, lead us not into temptation. N.T. Wright, in his um, free, by the way, online course on the Sermon on the Mount, you can go sign up for it. I would recommend it. That is an excellent course. He suggests that a better way of saying that line in the prayer, lead us not into temptation, is something more like, be with us in the time of trial. And the idea there very well may be that Jesus, as well as David, as well as anybody who's lived long enough, knows that trials are going to come, knows that hardship is going to come, and... Um, when those trials come, we have two forces pulling us in opposite directions as people of faith. There is the one force that pulls us away from God, and so it pulls us into a myopic, a kind of nearsighted selfishness where it's hard to see anything but ourselves. And oftentimes in those sorts of situations, we're going to escape into any variety of things, into work or relationships, whether proper or improper, into pleasures, into food, into drugs, into alcohol, into binging Netflix, into playing video games, into whatever it is that lets us escape from the world. We move, in essence, further away from God. When trials come in these moments, they reveal us to be something other than what we want to be. We respond in ways that are a part of the darkness rather than a counter testimony to the darkness. And that temptation is real. You've probably experienced it this year. Certainly one of the turning points for me over the last several years as uh, in many ways our life has changed in Casa de Sparks is to realize that I have not under the stress of these trials been the person I thought I was. Anger and cynicism and bitterness at times have controlled me more than I thought they ever would. And so in that time of trial, I came face to face with that temptation to move away from God. 
And so what Jesus prays for is that in the time of trial, rather than us moving away from God, God would draw us closer to him. Deliver us from the evil one in the time of trial. That when trials come, we might make the conscious and the willing and the tenacious decision to lean into God. And I think at the end of the day, that's what David's doing in Psalm 3. I don't think he's doing it perfectly. From the perspective of Christ, I would say, yes, it is problematic for us to be praying that God would shatter the teeth of our enemies, although I understand it. But what I see overall in an imperfect and um, haltering way, which I'm not going to condemn because I'm imperfect and haltering, my faith has starts and stops and tangents and side trips that I must recover from as well. But what I see David doing is I see David leaning into God. God, they've surrounded me, and God, they say that you won't even help me, but you are my shield, and you are my glory, and you are the one who restores me. The only reason I have sustenance of any sort that I can lay down and sleep and wake up is because of you. And I'm really scared now, but I'm not going to let that fear control me even though thousands of people are surrounding me because, God, you are my salvation and your blessing is on your people and rescue comes from you. you. See what David's doing there. He's not doing it perfectly and we can give him a pass on that. We can understand where he's coming from because we're not in this looking for rules. Oh, it must be okay to pray that we shatter the teeth of our enemies. We're looking at this from understanding, and we all understand that that fear and that frustration and that desperation does things to us. And we also all understand that we can be open and free to pray to God where we are in the moment, that it doesn't have to be perfect, that it doesn't have to be nailed down in every doctrinal sense. And God will hear, and he will understand, and he will answer our prayers in his wisdom. But David leans in to God. And I think perhaps, as bad as I am at doing this, this is where the wisdom of Psalm 3 comes in. There is wisdom in the notion that we can go to God in imperfect ways and express where we are, which is what David does here. There is, there is wisdom in leaning into God even when we don't know how it's going to turn out, even when we don't know how we're going to get out of this. And man, we need this now. We need to learn to lean into God and to trust God. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but right now, a lot of us in society, we are just bouncing around like golf balls and tiled bathrooms. We are desperate for solutions. We are uh, run amok with knee-jerk reactions and hot takes and things like that that feel good in the moment, it seemed right in the moment, but at the end of the day, they haven't been helpful and they haven't been useful. They're cathartic in the moment. Boy, that, that felt good. I got my zinger in. But they're not doing anything. And this is the time where we slow down and we lean faithfully, though imperfectly, into God. We trust that He will be the one who carries us through. We lean into that reality that we confess every week, that his will will come on earth as it is in heaven. And we dedicate ourselves to going out and acting as if that reality will come to pass, because it will. So church, let me just encourage you this week to push back against those various voices who are screaming for immediacy and for hot takes and for knee-jerk reactions. Let me encourage you this week to push back against those voices that build fear in your lives and rather lean into God and ask Him how you might better love in the situation that we find ourselves in, in all of the situations that we find ourselves in, how you might better act with wisdom, how you might better act with Christ-likeness lean in to God. Now church, let me pray for you and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. 
And I'm so thankful that we can pray together even though we are miles apart. And then we will remember who we are and we'll set you loose. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. Teach us your ways. Plant it deep inside of us that it becomes a part of who we are. We know this isn't some magical thing. We know it doesn't happen at the snap of a fingers, but your spirit works to form us and shape us. And we ask for the courage to be open to that formation and that shaping. We ask for the endurance to not grow faint in leaning into you. We ask that you give us the strength to stay the course. And Father, now we come to you and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and our mind and with all of our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment and a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, I miss seeing the top halves of your smiling faces. But we, by God's strength, will pull through this. And in the meantime, we are dedicated to loving our neighbors as best we can. We love you. We miss you. We'll see you soon. Go love. See you next time.